welcome to our presentation. Uh, my name is Jessica. I'm Nick. I'm Sven. And we're going to present our uh, Anchor Pro website. Um, our coach was Bas Moot, uh, and our client is Aguna Wardena. Uh, we got in contact with him while Nick, while Nick was doing his internship in Melbourne. Uh, Kusel is owner and founder of the Elite Academy Sports Medicine uh, and is located at the campus um, of the University of Melbourne. Predominantly, he treats athletes and members of the university and surrounding communities, and he is dedicated to promoting active lifestyles. Uh, a lot of Kusel's patients, as with many physiotherapists, uh, come in with an ankle sprain. In an effort to give them more autonomy, better and lasting results, he requested an evidence-based, step-by-step protocol that all of his patients, regardless of their athletic background, uh, could use independently online. Um, for example, this would be especially helpful when they've missed an appointment uh, or when they're away on training camps. So they can still continue their self-directed rehabilitative rehabilitation program. Um, our project is uh, meant to be as additional research that he can provide his patients as supplement to the care he gives them in clinic and not replacing it. Uh, as our client requested a website, um, this is what we have created. Um, so this is our front page um, with some information. Our ankle sprain 101 page uh, contains some information about <coughs> ankle sprains. Uh, and here you can see our rehabilitation plan. Um, and one uh, block, for example, would look like this. In order to help guide the creation of our website, um, we have uh, conducted a systematic review with the following research question. Uh, what is the most effective rehabilitative exercise program that can be performed at home that will return grade one and two ankle sprain patients to normal daily function and target modifiable intrinsic risk factors? Uh, a question while analyzing the finding of the main results uh, was, are rehabilitative exercises for ankle sprains effective when performed in a home setting? So before we're really going to show what we actually did, we will give some information of, uh, about ankle sprains. Uh, ankle sprain can be defined as a traumatic injury of the lateral uh, capsular ligamentous complex resulting from excessive supination and adduction in combination with a plantar flex foot. Therefore, it's often referred as an inversion trauma. Uh, structures that are commonly involved in ankle sprains are the anterior talofibular ligament, the calcaneal fibular ligament, and the uh, posterior talofibular ligament. 73% of all uh, inversion traumas include isolated ATFL injuries. Ankle sprain can be split into three grades. Uh, grade one includes a stretch uh, and some small tears. Grade two has a larger but an incomplete tear and grade, tr grade three involves a full tear and requires surgery. For the purpose of our project, we've only focused on grade one and two ankle sprains as that can be dealt with physiotherapy alone. The National Health Survey that's conducted in Australia in 2001 reported 367,000 injuries uh, of participating in an organized sport. 32% were ankle sprains, which was the leading number. So it can be said that ankle sprains are very common throughout the athletic community um, uh, in a variety of sports, such as basketball, dance, and one of the four most popular sports in Australia, Australian rules football. Risk factors include impaired balance, uh, decreased muscle strength and limitation in dose deflection. However, of all these risk, risk factors, previous sprains are the most important risk factor. Up to 80% of the people that have sprained their ankle will do so again. So I will now continue with the methods. Thank you, Jessica. We conducted a systematic review. There we go. Uh, of the literature using PubMed and Cochrane Library. As you can see here, we build up some keywords in order to make our search string. When selecting articles, we only included RCTs written in English. We also looked through systematic reviews to see if any relevant systematic uh, RCTs uh, came up. The test subjects had to be suffering from a current episode of grade one or two lateral ankle sprain. We included articles with exercises, stretches, or self-mobilizations that could be performed at home with easily accessible materials. Mm -hmm. The 
um, Pedro scale has been used to assess the quality of the RCTs. The articles were graded individually by at least uh, two of us. The inclusion cutoff score was five, five out of 11. In total, we found 485 articles um, and following the exclusion and grading process, we ended up with eight relevant articles of sufficient quality. The information we've got from the research is that there's no significant difference between supervised and unsupervised exercises. This means that patients that were given supervised exercises in clinic were not in an advantage to patients that did the exercises supervised at home. However, however, when these exercises were combined with manual therapy techniques, um, it, it was superior to, to patients who only received exercises. That means that by delegating these exercises to home, um, the physiotherapist can focus more time in clinic for, for these um, manual interventions. Um, furthermore, when um, early exercises in combination with RISE were included, these patients regained functional activity uh, faster than the patients who initially only uh, raised their injury. Some example exercises were uh, A1 or isometric exercises. Um, next, when targeting the modifiable risk factor, stretching in combination with exercises led to a significant improvement of dorsiflexion. Um, therefore, we included all stretches in in our program. Balance was found to be significantly improved by dynamic um, balance exercises and plyometrics. And furthermore, plyometrics were also found to be more effective in building up isometric strength than um, resistance training. Okay, Nick is continuing with the product description. Okay, so following this information, um, we kind of had a baseline upon which to build our protocol. But we still needed to fill it with exercises that were relevant to what we found. So to do this, we took the exercises that were actually used within the experiments, as well as um, from textbooks and expert opinion, and the prescriptive parameters were made using the um, theory used by the researchers, um, additional academic texts, and expert opinion as well. Uh, some of these were, you could use saw when Sven showed his slides. The, the protocol was built into five phases, with bringing the client all the way, the patient all the way from the initial inflammation on day zero, through to gaining mobility again, and into um, retraining higher level activities where the uh, dynamic balance exercises and the uh, plyometrics came more into play. These phases were then broken down into smaller building blocks of exercises that lasted a given number of days, a minimum number of days, and which the, the user um, progresses through as they master the exercises within the block. On top of this, there are certain checkpoints of, for self-assessment that correspond to milestones in the risk factors that um, were required prerequisites for some activity ex exercises in later blocks. This was added to make a safer, self-directed environment for an unsupervised uh, patient to use this. So this protocol was kind of the basis of what would then become Ankle Pro. Um, and that was made on the free uh, online hosting site WordPress. And what's great about having a website is that on top of being 24 hour, 24 seven accessible uh, anywhere that there's internet, yeah, um, you're also able to provide videos which have been found to be more effective at providing exercise instructions than just giving a paper with pictures and writing for patients. Um, so these 
because of that, we made a set of 37 videos that explain the exercises and their progressions, as well as tests, and additional care um, tips like bandaging that the client felt would make a more complete self-care online package. Um, the videos are hosted on a dedicated YouTube channel, and they've been uh, they've been embedded into the protocol to be viewable on the website itself, with the prescriptive information written underneath. An example of one of these videos is here. You will perform this exercise using stairs or a solid stepping stool. Step back so that the balls of your feet are resting on the edge of the step. Sink as deep into dorsiflexion flexion as your ankle will let you, then push up onto your toes. A surface or railing can be in front or beside you to aid with balance, but you should not help the movement with your hands. The lower you can sink down and higher you raise up will help train a wider functional range of motion. So there's different um, so that your ankles angles, out or and you can see when it gets on to higher progressions. Only one leg, the other one. Um, on top of this, the videos are grouped together on the YouTube channel to correspond with the blocks, um, so that if for some reason the website's not working properly, there's still the user's still able to see which exercises go together via a, like a troubleshooting method. Um, now, the protocol itself was the main part of the website, but a part of the unsupervised exercises in the experience we found was that there was a lot of uh, educational material provided to those patients. And so to incorporate this into our website, the as you saw with Jessica's overview, uh, the, the user is first passed through an ankle, ankle Spring 101 page where they see an overview of the pathology and um, get an idea of what we're trying to accomplish with the rehabilitation so they understand the importance of what they're, why they're doing what they're doing instead of just kind of getting forced to do these exercises. Then they're brought into the rehabilitation plan page where they're given the instructions um, and rules on how to progress themselves through the blocks and, uh, on their own and other tips like when to know if you've done too much and so on. Finally, as we said, uh, this is not meant to be um, getting rid of the physiotherapist's role in the care. It's just meant to be an adjunct um, to try to loosen the ties where they, they're reliant on, the patient's reliant on the physio to progress them. If they miss a, a session, they're still able to potentially progress all over the weekend or something before the next uh, possible appointment. Um, but to help with this, we also created an exercise diary that can be printed out for each block and filled in. And this can be used to keep track of which exercises to do if the client, the user is not um, near the internet connection when they're doing exercises, as well as write down notes or questions that they might have for the physio if there is a reason to not be able to um, use this completely on their own. In the end, we were able to make a product that made our client happy. Um, we got some great feedback from people with various healthcare backgrounds, as well as lay people, um, who felt that it was had a very professional and trustworthy look, and the information was very clear and informative, and it seemed like something that they would be willing to use in the future. Um, so because of that, we think it would be quite a, a potentially useful tool to help add um, that extra mile, something you can give to your clients for this very common pathology. Uh, a future potential research could be to do an RCT about the implementation of this and see if it's actually working as designed. Uh, are there any questions? Mm -hmm. <laughs>
everybody. Thanks, uh, Final. Good afternoon, as first, and thank you, Nadra, for your attention. As yesterday, you are almost the very last group, but please don't give your attention on us. So, what are we going to see today together? We want to introduce our presentation, right from our pub thesis, titled as following. What was the desire and wish of our client? We, we had first instance to collect, um, yeah, to make a collection of the most effective evidence-based treatments related to Achilles tendinopathy and plantar fasciopathy that, according to him, was missing in the literature. After exhaustive discussions, we agreed to include the following definitions for these two particular pathologies. Plantar fasciitis is defined, according to Ron Petal, as a disorder of the plantar fascia consequent to overuse that is always associated with degenerative changes. Achilles tendinopathy is defined as a pathological state of the tendon that results from overuse or loading and then may lead to a catabolic effect on tendon nitrogenity. This is the definition of Cook et al. A uh, little bit of uh, notions, why is it important in case you want to be a physical therapist and you want to deal with foot pathologies mainly. Achilles tendinopathy it accounts for 5 until 18% of all running injuries. It may involve lesions of different portions of the Achilles tendon, respectively non-insertional and insertional Achilles tendinopathy. We're going to define it better later and usually is associated with loss of muscle power, uh, surrounding tissues involvement, and of course, loss of prestations in case we're dealing with athletes. Every year in the United States, when we're talking about plantar fasciopathy instead, you find out that two millions of individuals are receiving treatment for this condition, and the 11, from 11 to 15% of all foot pain-related professional visits are actually plantar fasciopathy. The etiology of plantar fasciopathy is, is not really understood. We only know that there are several risk factors that actually are more likely to cause these conditions. Just name a couple of them. Bone spurs, pronator, foot type, obesity, limb length discrepancy, and of course, long standing during a work shift. So, what was our actual aim? Our client has already mentioned one, a very broad collection, a very broad research of all the possible tre physical therapy conservative treatments currently on the market, if I can say that. And he wanted to prove which, in, which ones, in terms of body function and pain re relief, were the best ones. So, if I read our research question, what are the best available conservative treatment options for plantar fasciopathy and achilles tendinopathy in terms of foot function recovery and pain reduction, I actually target exactly the end. We hope we couldn't be clearer than that. Now, I pass the speech to Vadim, who's going to tell something about the methods. How did we do the research? Yeah, thank you, Matteo. It was super quick and interesting. <laughs> uh, so, uh, regarding the methods, what we did? Uh, we did a comprehensive literature research in the following um, databases. And it goes to about MedFed, you know, science direct, those you know already. Using the uh, following uh, searching strategies, uh, with the uh, synonyms. Uh, regarding the inclusion criteria for types of the studies, we did include our RCTs, like it was mentioned in the previous um, uh, presentations. Articles were in English mainly, uh, all of them were in English, types of participants listed here, uh, types of interventions. Quality was checked by all of us. Uh, using the Cochrane reading list. Those articles that scored seven or higher were included uh, in our research. So here you see all the steps that we went through. The first one, it was uh, more than uh, 11,000 hits in the, in the first search. Secondly, we kick off the, we use the uh, screening in the title of the articles and in the abstract, so 554 or less. Uh, later we screened and we kick off double articles and we separate plantar fascia and uh, Achilles and tendopathy into, into different parts. So later we came up having uh, 118 full text articles and 41 here in this stage, in the yeah, in this stage, we grade them using the Cochrane uh, grade list, and finally 43, 29, and 14, we used uh, for this particular systematic review. I'm passing my word uh, 
to Michael. Okay, thanks, Vadim. Um, yeah, I, will I will start to present the outcome of our research, um, which are the most effective treatments for these conditions that we uh, investigated. So for uh, plantar fasciopathy, the most effective treatments were shortwave therapy and plantar fascia-specific stretching. We're going to explain later in detail what it is, how it is applied, um, but those have been found to be the most effective, and uh, shockwave therapy was uh, uh, shown to be most effective in uh, reducing pain. Um, that was compared a lot in a lot of studies directly to placebo group, or it was compared to a different treatment, uh, like Botox in one case, but also others, um, or in combinations, but it always showed positive results, and um, so th this one we can really recommend there's a lot of evidence behind uh, this treatment. Uh, plantar fascia specific stretching, this one showed very good results in uh, function improvement. Um, yeah, we're going to have to wait for a, li a little bit uh, before we explain what exactly it is. Additional effective treatments were uh, foot orthosis, acupuncture and man manual therapy. Um, additional effective treatments, those we recommend in case they are available. Um, Add them to the to the treatment. Um, orthosis, for example, yeah, the, as you know, devices you could uh, put into your shoes and uh, use them for walking and standing during work. It can reduce uh, pain there, for example. But also, you need to buy them. Are they covered by insurance? Yes or no? So these kind of uh, problems you have to consider if you add them or not. Then acupuncture, of course, it has to be given by a specialist, so not everyone can just put a needle somewhere. And manual therapy, there's also additional education required. And also later we're going to explain what exactly, uh, what kind of manual therapy was effective. And then we uh, go on with Achilles tendinopathy. Again, showwave therapy was effective and eccentric exercises. That is also interesting because um, eccentric exercises, there is a lot of evidence for those exercises. Uh, and a little, like a small amount of evidence pointing that other forms of exercises can be as effective. But for now, the evidence is only, unfortunately, there for the eccentric exercises. And as an additional treatment, yeah, uh, for Achilles tendinopathy, we can so far only uh, recommend uh, laser therapy, mostly in the form of low-level laser therapy. And another interesting form we found was gel, which is also laser therapy, high-level laser therapy, and it is combined with a cold airflow. So, so uh, yeah, an airflow of minus 30 degrees, really cold, is uh, applied to the same spot. Okay, here's the treatment protocol. That's uh, also our product. That is one part of the product we handed to our client. And this is the way we presented uh, the line of treatment to him. So as you see, first line of treatment, so we really recommend uh, this treatment uh, for his practice, is this plantar fascia specific stretching and show wave therapy. If available uh, for the patient, you should also add foot orthosis and uh, the form of manual therapy we're going to explain. And Alternative treatment in case the specialist is available is acupuncture. And now we go a little bit more into detail. You see uh, shockwave therapy. Um, as you see on the picture here, this is um, this is how it's applied on the painful spot or on the, uh, yeah with the machine. And yeah, we just we now represent one um, example, which showed to be very successful in this case by Rompet uh, al. And he used only three sessions uh, once a week. And yeah, the parameters, if you're interested in the parameters, we uh, will hand out the, uh, the product and then you can see it. So we don't need to go that much into detail. The next one, uh, here it is, plantar fascia specific stretching. Um, yeah, on the picture you can also get an idea how it's done. The patient is sitting, as described here. Uh, one leg is crossed over the other. Um, and the patient himself pulls his uh, toes into the dorsal fraction and he should feel the stretch. The pain shouldn't be that much, it should be yeah, bearable. 
uh, to him. And also, the, that was from the same study, this example, also on Al, he did it for eight weeks and uh, three times a day. Advantage over the shockwave therapies, the there's no machine required, no investment, therefore, a disadvantage is the patient has to do it himself, and of course he has to do it correctly, so that's the instruction, but still very effective treatment as found in the study. So, with the second line of treatment, I pass it over to Matteo. Thanks, Michael. Yeah. Okay. okay, here are a general overview of the second line of treatment, meaning very useful as additional and recommended as additional treatment to the ones just seen with Michael. What do we find? Silicon, does it work? Yes. Silicon immune cells, meaning full length silicon immune cells. If constantly worn, we say constantly worn because in this case the participants had to wear them all day long and were not allowed to interrupt their, their daily life routine, including sports and working activity. Uh, the study that lasted one month by your solitary was found to be actually very effective as a treatment. Agopuncture, we have to expose it a little bit. What does it mean, PC7 agopuncture? The PC7 point is actually according to the Chinese uh, tradition related to the heel pain and it is exactly proximal to the carpal area between the tendon of the flexor carpi radialis and the palmaris longus. Between these two tendons, raise a small step, spot, and if I apply a 15 millimeters needle, 10 millimeters deep, I gain a very effective treatment for what we found. Once a day, 30 minutes of treatment for two weeks. This is also what we found very effective. This kind of we call it mammal therapy, but actually we meant soft tissue mobilization, which is a very, very, very aggressive soft tissue mobilization applied in this way. You can see a little bit from the picture. The patient should require full stretch, if not possible, a little slight inversion, and uh, the therapist will apply a very aggressive soft uh, <coughs> tissue mobilization once directly the insertion of the plantar fascia, the other one directing the triceps or the gastrocnemius. Two times a week, according to Clean the Call. Now, I will pass again the speech to Vadim, who will go on with Achilles tendinopathy. Yeah, thank you, Matteo. So, for the Achilles tendinopathy, our findings were, uh, you see the first line of, the line of treatment and the second line of the treatment. So, this is the primarily uh, treatments that were uh, um, uh, that they had the largest amount of uh, evidence based. Uh, we were quite surprised having the exercise therapy <coughs> compared as effective as a shockwave. And the, the last one is uh, laser therapy. So which uh, exercise therapy? It was eccentric uh, exercises, basically super uh, easy exercise you, you ask your patient to get on the step or on the stair lower himself down until the dorsal flexion is fully uh, um, reached. This uh, treatment needs to be applied three times a week, uh, three sets in 15, with 15 repetitions. The treatment was done one week. The second one uh, was uh, the shockwave. It specifically needs to be applied on the um, on the spot of uh, Achilles tendinopathy, so on the, the inflammation spot, and uh, once a, uh, once a week, uh, and I'm not going to go into the details of intensity. I think it's uh, it's clear or makes sense for for the um, for the specialist. And the last one is uh, laser therapy. Low level laser therapy uh, was done uh, with a frequency of uh, two times a week. Uh, in uh, during eight weeks. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? Uh, what was the outcome measurement? Was it pain? Or was it, it, it was either pain or um, function, like foot function. And there was also a little bit of the problem because the outcome measure, like pain, was not always done on the vascular, but on sometimes other things were used, uh, a measure of the fun food function index or other things, and function, it was even like the, the variety was even bigger than uh, function measurements. Did, yeah, did, did you, sorry, can I? Just uh, 
did, did you find anything on exercising uh, to increase the arch of the foot? Like, uh, for example, strengthening of the tibialis posterior? For, for the plantar fasciopathy? Yeah. You mean? yeah. Um, no, not really. We did not find anything. Yeah. Because it's up to my knowledge, like what you would do, or yeah. what I did. So maybe it's, it was just uh, not based on any evidence. If I could interfere and, uh, and complete your answer, well, actually, we did find some pro exercise protocols mm -hmm. uh, which included some forms of gastronomic exercises. Now I wouldn't remember by heart exactly because our research were quite broad. We found 43 articles, but none of them were included because they weren't proven as effective as uh, actually the exercise. Uh, yeah, the structure. Those were, yeah so mostly were like um, calf muscle exercises were, were covered by some studies. Even for uh, for plantar uh, um, fasciopathy, and yeah, those uh, were usually not better than the con control group. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, Hi, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It's nice. It happens to be a topic I know about. So I had some questions. Oh, next well. Week. <laughs> 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 you have led by your findings, so I was getting the just as happy as you guys to finish. Um, now, could I please see your, your references or the list of included studies? We have a table in which you have. Yeah, we have it in the paper. In the, yeah, in the thesis and then. We have it in the paper. We didn't place it in the, in the presentation. We only have a list of reference of the mentioned articles or the definitions. In our paper, there is both the list of the 43 included articles and also a reference of all the initial 236 articles can be found. So in case you want to we can also send it to them. Now, you know what my concern is? Is that if I do a search in Cochrane, mm -hmm. I get a 2014 um, systematic review that, that uh, shows exactly what you've just done, only with different results. So my concern is that why but maybe then if you I'll have a look at your paper and see how you get to your results. Oh, this but, one. but maybe can you then clarify a bit more about your methods, how you came to the results for Achilles tendinopathy, for example. How did you get to um, are we gonna do eccentric exercises? Um, the protocol, for example, that you showed here. Um, no, sorry, I'm trying to ask 60 questions. Can, we, uh, can I take the answer? I think I, I know what you mean, Mom. If if I understood that, well, uh, the the, pro uh, the, pr the process uh, was the, the following. Uh, starting from these 14 articles here, after graded so the articles included for Achilles tendinopathy, we uh, looked actually in terms of p value. What well, was the most? Can I interfere? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's actually it was RCT, and you 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 mentioned systematic reviews. So we we yeah, we well, did the same. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, so that's, uh, that's not comparable. You said you only found uh, uh, systematic reviews. Is that what you said? Well, a systematic review done on our with a similar research question and different outcomes. Uh, yeah. Uh, for example, but maybe um, I'll I'll read the paper and then I'll come find you. And I'll <laughs> <laughs> one as well. But maybe could you then just clarify the protocol for the eccentric? You say this uh, eccentric uh, uh, heel drop and mm -hmm. on, this, on the step has to be done three times a week. <coughs> uh, that is actually, yeah. The, no, this is what the, 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 the authors did. So yeah, that's, that's an example of one successful study, uh, what the authors did. It's not that we formed a new kind of um, protocol that we say you have to do this, but this protocol showed in this study uh, very good results. On so pain, eh? On, uh, it was on pain, I think, yes. Also, my result was both on pain and function. Okay. So, in terms of pain and function, applying mm -hmm. this uh, routine for one week should lead us to the same outcome as my result. Okay, now, in all these other 43 articles, were there more authors that supported this protocol or that supported? Can you give an indication? Well, uh, there were more, there were more authors that supported the same form of uh, of treatment. So, eccentric exercise 
uh, done uh, eccentrically against, uh, let's say, body weight resistance. But this protocol uh, was not repeated by any other also. No. Okay. At least not exactly. There was a very similar protocol. Yeah, there was some but, but that was always a real loss of the problem because yeah. there were not, like, I don't think two exactly same protocols were found in, 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 those, uh, yeah. in those studies. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, please carry on. I have a question about uh, the plantar fasciitis in PC7 that you were talking about, pericardium 7. Do you know why it works? <laughs> it wasn't plantar uh, fasciitis. Yeah, yeah, why, why yeah, that? That's why. Well, all I know as a physical therapy student in four years is that according to medical, the Chinese tradition, that specific spot related to heel pain. I would have no any uh, anything more than uh, than this. Well, there is no how anatomy how physiological. How they make this connection? Like? No, it's a uh, Chinese medicine. It's something we don't find in Europe. Uh, in so what kind of study was that for them to come to come to the conclusion that PC7 is a good point? No, they just studied the difference between uh, this specific acupuncture technique on that spot and an acupuncture so, technique on the other on another spot. So here is, here you can see the author. It was Zan at all. Yes, you can find the uh, find easily the article is also mentioned in the reference. You will find a study between a group, a control group, who received the acupuncture treatment on a different spot than PC7, and actually PC7 showed benefit in terms also in vascular, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And, the, and the control group they had just if you're interested, they put the needle in a in a different point, so they use that as a as a kind of placebo treatment. Yeah. But that there's so many other points. Why did they? Like, I yeah, guess it's a flaw in the research, but like, I don't know why. Well, it's just, it's just why do you have the point? Why can't you and this one was effective. Like, yeah. This point was effective, and I think the other needle was put uh, also on the hand, but in a slightly different spot, and the outcome was completely different. Now, your question so, is actually very interesting. It's but interesting, but it yeah, wasn't no. our job to call the, 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 the research and say, why do you place it there? So the um, question is, we have to <laughs> make our foundings on their findings. So that's what we have to do. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yes? Are we as physios allowed to use shockwave therapy? Do you know? I don't know. No, you need to get licensed. Yeah. In the Netherlands, you need to get licensed. Okay. Yeah. But in almost all of the rest of the European countries, not. Okay. I did uh, shockwave therapy in Italy. I did shockwave therapy in Malta as part of my internship. You actually don't need a license for acupuncture in, in the Netherlands. It's not, it's not a safe title. Anybody could do it. No, I think yeah. you need to have special force to get the. <laughs> you need a certificate, but yeah. you don't need to be licensed. Yeah. To do the, the you need a certificate. That is true. Because yeah. That's what I'm asking. <laughs> okay. Different discussion. I know. Other questions, guys? We still have five minutes.
Or not, or not, focus, eyes forward. Shall we? So now that the cavalry has arrived. Okay, guys. Attention. Okay. So we are Orla Mahoney and Francisco Javier Alonso, and we are going to present our bachelor project. Yeah. So I want to ask you first one question. How many of you practice regularly volleyball, handball, or tennis? Okay. Uh, how? Like six. Yeah. How many of you suffer an uh, injury in the shoulder or pain? So, well, more than I expect. Yeah. Well, the, yeah. You have to work out a little more. Eh? <laughs> no, I, I think you are going to find uh, interesting our, our presentation, and I hope our program will help you in the future. So to start, I want to introduce our client, Vinicio Santos, he's a Brazilian physiotherapist, and I had the pleasure to meet him during my second internship in Rio de Janeiro. He works as a physiotherapist for the Brazilian Federation of Volleyball, and he treats injuries and also work preventing injuries in guiding coaches and players. Besides that, he has his own practice, Vinci Physiotherapy. And then I contact with Vinicio when we start with the with the pub and to ask him how could we could help him. And he told us about the high incident of shoulder injuries in volleyball players and how we could maybe have the possibility to develop a prevention program. So all I had, we conduct our initial research to see how to approach the topic, and we found that uh, there were, despite there are several opinions from experts in the field there were no any prevention protocol, and in part was due to the lack of consensus between authors to, to set which are the real factors for shoulder injuries. So we decided to help to resolve the problem, to help in, to find this, uh, identify this systematic risk factor, conducting <coughs> a systematic review. But before to go in that, I want to explain you another concept that it comes out and that we adopted, and it's the concept of overhead and lift. So this term, group of those who practice a sport which involves to move the arm over the head in a similar motion that spiking in volleyball, throwing in handball, or uh, baseball also, uh, or serving in tennis. And this is because from a biomechanical point of view, the requirement pattern is really similar. And yeah, this has been a deeply studied, dividing the movement in phases. We are not going to go too much in this. But I want you to realize the, the huge amount of uh, stress that this plays on the shoulder, which adds to the repetitive nature of the motion within the sport, make the shoulder really vulnerable to injury, especially if you have any deficit. So as I say, we conduct a systematic review in corporate studies, and for those who don't remember, which is a corporate study, you can see this picture, and Corpo was the name of the military unit in the Roman Legion, so they were tracked during the war to see what happened with them. And that was happened to the population of our studies. They are assessed at the beginning under the risk factor in investigation, and then they are monitored through the season. And at the end, they check if those who, who had the risk factor were more predisposed to suffer shoulder injury or not. And all that will continue now. Okay, so now I'm going to take you through the systematic review. Um, so we conducted our research and we searched numerous databases to find 418 articles at the start. We then screened those down and we excluded anything that did not directly relate to our research question. We excluded anything that wasn't a prospective cohort and we excluded anything that did not focus on overhead athletes. Um, so. After the screening, we then had uh, seven articles left. Um, the, this chart shows you exactly the distribution of them throughout the world. Um, we included articles written in English, Spanish and Portuguese. And we only included articles that were published after January 2000. Um, so, to give you a better view of the overhead athlete concept that we were using, uh, this shows exactly which sports were included in the articles that we found. And as you can see, baseball is the most commonly included. Um, and yeah, that's 
So, um, so I'm going to give you more details now about exactly what the articles we you, we included were about. Um, what the article, what they did, what the studies did was they uh, assessed uh, overhead athletes on proposed uh, risk factors, and then they monitored them for incidents of injury till the end of the study. Um, this chart here shows the incidents, and as you can see, the lowest incidence in our articles is 15%. Um, which kind of goes just to kind of gives more basis to why we're doing this, just that the lowest is such a high number. Um, so here you can see our quality and we used two grading tools. We used the CASP and the National Institute of Health tool. Um, the reason we used two is because there is yet to be a critically evaluated tool for grading cohorts and we just wanted to use two so that we could compare and see if we could get differences between the outcomes. Um, as you can see, we had two high quality articles out of our seven and then the rest were moderate quality. Um, there was numerous reasons for lower quality, but um, one reason that stood out to us was that um, to only two of the articles used multivariate logistical regression data and um, the, the rest only used univariate which means that they did not properly um, account for confounders which would obviously affect the quality. Um, so we, here we have the potential risk factors investigated. I'm not going to say exactly which articles investigated what. If you want to know more about that yourself, you can have a look at our beautiful poster. <laughs> um, but the risk factors that were looked at were scapular dyskinesis, glenohumeral range of motion deficits, uh, history of injury, uh, and we had shoulder muscle imbalance or weakness, uh, forward shoulder posture, and demographics. And the demographics were whether they were uh, male or female, or uh, and which position they played in the team. So this takes us to our results, <coughs> and basically there's just three of those already mentioned factors that we need to focus on here that were actually identified, which is you know humor range of motion deficits, which was identified by 50% of the articles that studied it, uh, history of injury, same thing, 50%. And uh, shoulder muscle weakness or imbalance was identified by 100%, 5 out of 5 articles that studied it, and that's 5 out of our overall 7. So from that, we were able to draw our conclusion. <coughs> and our conclusion was basically that um, in order to prevent injury in overhead athletes, um, you should be strengthening include strengthening of the rotator cuff in the in the training program and particularly uh, ex uh, eccentric external rotation and as well as that uh, stretching should be included to maintain good glenohumeral range of motion and also it was the same uh, particular focus on external rotation. Um, so now I'm going to pass you back to Francisco, who's going to go into detail about the product that we developed based on our systematic review. Yeah. So based in the, in the results that we found in the systematic review and the huge knowledge that we gained through the process, we will add our, system, our prevention program. But uh, we believe, and that's part of the knowledge we gained, that before to start with any program, you assess, you, you treat uh, athletes, I strongly advise to, to assess them at the beginning of the season and monitor them throughout the season. And this is why, because the, despite there are several estimations, there is no real cut-off values to diagnose a specific deficit. So you want to know if your, your player has shoulder imbalance, muscle imbalance, uh, glenohumeral range of motion deficit, or muscle weakness, you need to monitor. The, the and this is the key. 
of the, of the assessment. So the shoulder form is uh, divided in three parts. The first part is clear in detail how to assess glenodumia and of motion. So we assess uh, domia and no dominant site, and we compare internal, external, and total range of motion measurements. There is a strength uh, our protocol based on a recent study with high internal in internal re reliability and an excellent validity in comparison with the isokinetic texting, which is the gold standard. And with this, we measure the the muscle imbalance and the and the rotator cuff weakness. It is present. We are comparing the protocol with a, a table with normal values for volleyball players that the clinician can use as a reference. And yeah, we incorporate actually two more two more extra tools that can uh, assess further aspects that were not covered in the systematic review are our fatigue, requirement pattern, core stability, and trauma mobility. So this one. So the prevention program in cell is divided in three parts. The first part is focusing on maintaining the brain of motion. Overhead at least normally present uh, adaptations in the dominant arm. So the glenohumeral brain of motion in the, in the dominant arm is the same than in the no dominant arm, but with an increase in external rotation and a decrease in internal rotation. Beyond that, any deficit should be treated as was identified as a risk factor and we choose some myofascial release and a stretching exercise based in uh, some studies and systematic reviews. Targeting mainly the latissimus dorsi, teres major, and pectoralis magnum, which are commonly tied in overhead at least. The second part focuses on strengthening of the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff is the, the structure that gives the stability to the glenohumeral joint, resisting the distraction forces at the end of the throwing. So it's really, really important. And normally, uh, overhead at least present strong internal rotators and weak on no difference uh, in the strength in the external rotators comparing to the non-dominant side. So this was this muscle imbalance was identified identified in the systematic review as a risk factor also as muscle weakness. So we choose uh, some interventions ranging from concentric to eccentric uh, ways and targeting internal and also external rotation based in uh, electromyography studies. Um, yeah. Last part is uh, focusing on scapular stabilization and functional exercise. Okay. I want to drink a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, scapular dyskinesis. <laughs> Sorry. Scapular dyskinesis was only identified but one of four studies as a risk factor. However, this was due to that uh, three of the studies only assess scapular dyskinesis in a static way which in overhead and lead is not really ideal because, as I said, they, they present adaptations. So only the study who assessed scapular dyskinesis in a dynamic way found it as a risk factor. So we incorporate some exercise which uh, aim to, to get a outward rotation of the scapula in a more efficient way, uh, targeting serratus anterior and lower trapezius based on also EMG activity studies. And beside that, we include uh, functional exercise as a wish for client in order to make all the kinetic chain work together and work another aspect of the, of the motion, like uh, core stability, trunk uh, mobility, and yeah, fatigue. Some studies recently also show that uh, incorporate a reverse lunge and trunk rotation increase the and the activity in the serratus anterior and lower trapezius. And these and another tips, you can find them in the prevention program with some cues how to instruct your patients. So now we just hope that Benicius and his intense can apply the protocol and maybe reduce the rate of injuries in the volleyball players. And that was it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 I'd also like to say a big thank you to Tara Vanderpuff, who was our model, and a big thank you to Mel Major, who was our coach. Yeah,
Oh. Is there any reason why you chose specifically those sports for the FBA? Um, like, well, we chose um, the, well, we didn't particularly choose the sports, but the articles that we found had those sports in them. And we also, like, excluded, like, rugby and football just because there's the coll collision aspect to it. And we felt that that would affect how the mechanism of injury is. So, then in that line, sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> so your main focus was on overuse. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Overuse. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Out of my own experience, I know that the sport that has the, in the highest incidence, which was handball, yeah. the most shoulder injuries in handball actually are contact injuries. Yeah, that, that, that's true. The point is when we assess the studies, it's really difficult to distinguish which injuries are due to trauma and which one are due to overuse because normally the, the physiotherapists and the assessors they don't follow the team so if the, they register the injuries send, fill in a questionnaire and send it in so in these questionnaires that uh, we assess one of the requirements was that uh, they study over, overuse injuries so we get out of that aspect when, when you yeah. Um, you presented the percentage. Yeah. That was just the percentage of our articles. It wasn't like a. Yeah, it was uh, the the record that um, in the in the cohort studies of the systematic yeah. review. Were it's not like each sport in general. It's the what was recorded in in our article. Yeah. yeah. For example, here it says seventeen to forty percent because there were two studies. So one of the studies recorded seventeen percent of injuries but the other one record at 40%. Okay. Yeah. Um, Any question? Hello. Really? Can you go through the results? Yeah, the, uh, how did you, or the articles identify the many mineral range of motion that you Yeah, okay, so I think I'm going to use the board. <laughs> Can you, yeah. Okay, so you imagine the day one, you, you at least come to the practice, and so you measure the no dominant side, so he's really happy, the season is starting. <laughs> <laughs> and then you, you, you met normally to measure, the, based on the, on the studies that we saw, the, the higher reliability, you have to put your, one of your hands in the, with your fingers in the spine of the scapula and the thumb in the coracoid process. So then you passively adapt the, the arm to 90 degrees and you internally rotate first. And as soon as you feel the scapula is moving, you stop. And that is the, the measurement of internal rotation because you can imagine you push further, the scapula is going to move and maybe you gain 10 degrees more. So let's say in the no dominant, he comes, you measure, and you have the classic 90 degrees in internal rotation and external rotation, the 90 degrees. And then you measure the dominant arm. And you have, let's say, 110 external rotation and 70 internal rotation. So some people will think that this is a, a deficit of 20 degrees in uh, internal rotation. But it is, it's not, you know, because the, the total range of motion is similar in both shoulders. But imagine he's coming the day 16 after four games, and then you assess this again. You have here, he less happy because he was kilos. <laughs> and then imagine you have 100 degrees, or let's say 90 degrees, here and 70. So we say 90. Huh? So you can see here that you are missing some degrees because, in comparison, I have came two weeks before, you have a, here a total range of motion of 160. So you have here 20 external rotation deficit of 20 degrees. So then you should go with your player and show him uh, our program and 
yeah, make sure he's, he's stretching, his pectoral is minor, in order to get the full brain of motion. Because otherwise, if he continues like this, will be more predisposed than normal to suffer a nice. <laughs> no more questions? Emily? All right, so I hope I received your information correct. I think it's going off of that question. What I understood was that external internal rotation should be slightly higher in your dominant arm. Internal? Internal and external rotation? No, not, not what happened. For your first, <laughs> okay. in what? your protocol yeah. for the okay. first one, range of motion, that's what I'm referring to. Ah, here in the draw. Yeah, maybe it's not to this question. It's not to this question, Javier. It's in, in your, general. Yeah, in general, you no, said in, ge in general, normally, overhead at least has more in external rotation than internal rotation. And this is because during growth, the final alignment of the humerus happens. But if you start throwing with six years, seven years, then the, the alignment of the humerus, it doesn't get to the same position than in the not dominant arm. So you have a little retroversion, which makes you go more in external rotation and lose a little internal rotation, but the total range is the same. Okay, the total range, oh, okay, total range, is, so it was the same question, kind of. But how would you know if they're like hypermobile? You know, like... Yeah, normally they are, but... How many yeah, degrees is Yeah, but in, hypermobility is not something that happens more inside of the joint, because the capsule is more loose. Overhead at least they are more loose anteriorly and less uh, more tight in the posterior part of the capsule. I mean, because the T ROM should be the same on both sides, so if okay. your T ROM is out of your ear, it's know. way if bigger I than your <laughs> And is this only applicable to athletes, overhead athletes, and not just like if you measured us, our dominant? Well, the, what what happened with you, I don't think you have a different in the alignment of the humerus in both sides. I mean, you have maybe a little difference, but. In at least they have, they can have even 10 degrees difference in the alignment of the show, of the humerus. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Let's go drink. <laughs> <laughs>